developmental stages, the eight psychosocial stages of development. Eric Erickson was the psychologist who penned this decades ago, back in the 50s, I believe. And he studied kids. That was his whole career, was studying kids, how they develop, and the things that happen that contribute to that development. So this is, is uh, his stuff. You can find it, tons of it on the internet. Look up Erickson and stages of development. You'll find like, you know, a thousand pages of this stuff. Um, stage one, zero to 18 months. Now, for a baby, that's a long time. So there's two different parts to this. But the key part of stage one is what they're supposed to develop is trust. So zero, let's say zero to six months, okay? Uh, I have a four month old at home. Uh, she sleeps in a pack and play in our room. Uh, she's awake two, two or three times a night, driving my wife nuts. Um, <laughs> it's, it's life with a baby, we all know that. Now when she cries, um, that's a signal that she's hungry, she's tired, she needs a diaper change, or she wants some attention, okay? So baby cries, that's the signal, we respond to the signal, baby learns trust. Baby learns if I signal and they come, they will take care of me, I can trust that because it's happened over and over and over and I'm safe to hold them. My other daughter, number six, is not nah, maybe a year and a half, she's just under 18 months. Now there's times where in the middle of the night or when we put her down for a nap, she cries. Well guess what? She just ate. I just changed her diaper. We just played a whole bunch. She's tired. She needs to sleep. She cries. Do I go get her? I let out. Sorry, old school. I let her cry it out. <laughs> she needs to go to sleep. Now, is she in danger? Is she going to come up with some belief that I don't care about her and she's abandoned? No, she's 18 months old, or almost 18 months old. She's different than a six month old. So you have to apply that to this stage. Zero to 18 months, the task in a child's life is to learn to trust the world around them, and by extension, to trust themselves. A little difficult to do in zero to 18 months. Right there. If that doesn't happen, They fall into mistrust. They do not trust the world around them. They learn through whatever circumstances that when they signal to get their needs met, they're not answered. So they learn that they cannot trust the people around them, the world around them, what's going on, whatever it is. Now, this is um, particularly dicey with an adopted kid. When you have an adopted kid, there's a disruption in trust, possibly for a lifetime. When you have an adopted kid, they learn early, sometimes before they talk, pre-verbal, that they cannot trust the world around them. If that stays, if that is not undone and reworked, reprogrammed, they will have issues with trust for the rest of their life. Now, I never give up. I'm, I'm not your traditional therapist, I'm tenacious. I get my teeth in something and I don't let go. So that means I'm not the therapist for everybody, and I know that. So I don't give up on people. I don't give up on kids, I don't give up on marriages. Those are the two things I see the most of. And when, uh, when somebody has been adopted, and they had that early break in trust, and they have abandonment issues or whatever the package is. It's delicate. But I don't use a, a, a fine saw, I use a rough saw. Because you just gotta go after it. You gotta go after it. And you can go after it with all kinds of things. Look, here's the situation. Here's the parents who love you. They adopt you. You gotta learn. Bring God into it and say, look, your Father in Heaven is always your Father. And for kids and, and teenagers, they often experience that as nebulous. They, don't, they, they can't quite grasp that, uh, especially when you talk about adoption. You still talk about it, but it's difficult for them. But 
but you gotta go after it. You gotta sink your teeth into it. And I'm not saying, you know, be belligerent or be rude or, or be condescending or dismissive of anything that they say. But you gotta go after it. That is the core issue. Abandonment is a big deal. And if kids don't resolve that, they're gonna have projected problems for the rest of their life. That's how important it is. Sorry, that was a sidebar. Um, so, zero 18 months is trust and mistrust. The next one, stage two. Eighteen months to three years old. What's one of the big milestones in a child that age? What do they usually begin doing at that time? Potty training. Walking and talking, potty training, big stuff, right? Big stuff. And hopefully, if they are successful in that stage, what they will learn is autonomy. I can do things on my own. My um, um, number six daughter, who is, she's now walking. The first week she started walking, our whole house was excited. I mean, it was just, we were through the roof every day. Because she, the first day she took three steps, then she took eight, then it was 16, then it was across the room, then it was, you know, and this was, you know, hours of boom, 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 fall, boom, 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 fall. You know, there was lots of falls in it, but she would get up and giggle every time. Because she's like, I'm walking, kitty! <laughs> Guess what happened week two? Okay. <laughs> Buckle fracture way down here, down low, paint cast above the knee. And she had just started walking. And we were like, oh, really? Guess what? She tried to walk in the cast. Because she had just learned to walk. But that foot, it just wouldn't go all the way down. She's like, and she was trying to walk. She, she is missing the pen. And she's a bruiser. She, she was 9'2 when she was born. Her brother right before her was 9-1, I swear they're twins. I mean, she's going to be a linebacker just like that. <laughs> I mean, she, she's a tank. And she's determined. She's going to go do this stuff. Well, eventually, with, she had a cat on for uh, four weeks. She gave up. She just stopped because it was too hard. Right before she got the cast off, she had figured out how to drop that foot right on the edge of the cast. So she walked. She gave up, but then she came right back to it. She did not give up completely. That's how determined she was. She wanted to be autonomous. She said, not only is my favorite toy across the room, and I have a cat stone, but I'm going to go get it. That's autonomy. Now, if that doesn't happen, this is where we begin to see stuff. They begin to think, wait a minute, my cousin over there, who's the same age as I am, she can walk across the room. Why can't I do it? What's wrong with me? Not, why can't I walk? What's wrong with me? They personalize it to the point of, there's something different about me than everybody else. What's wrong with me? Why is there a difference? What is it that, that makes me so different than everybody else? That's huge. Third one. Three to six years old. Big event three to six years old is school. They go to school for the first time. They're in a classroom of maybe 30 kids. They're the same age. They're all doing the things, same things. What do they start doing? Comparing themselves to their peers. Probably the first time they've been in that kind of environment. So, so, not only am I my own person, not only am I my own person and I can go do things, but can I start something? Can I start something on my own? Teacher gives you an assignment. Go get your favorite toy from the toy shelf and bring it to the car. Guess why they do that? Because it's initiative. They're teaching kids that they can go and do something, make their own decisions, because they get to choose. 
And what he stands there and says, your favorite toy is that one. Today. Tomorrow. He says, no. They get to go choose their own favorite toy. And they bring it back. That's huge in a kid's life. Maybe that's the first time they've ever done that. If that does not happen, now we have a kid who looks at that and says, not only might there be something wrong with me, but it's so wrong that I can't. I can't do this stuff. And because I can't, I feel bad about myself. Now, let's define the difference between shame and guilt. People often use them interchangeably. They are totally different. Guilt is about what you do. It's behaviorally based. I do something, I feel guilt because I should not have done that. Maybe I hurt somebody. Maybe I said something I shouldn't have. Maybe I, I, I stole something from another kid. Guilt is about what you do. Shame is different. It's about who I am. Guilt is about what I do. Shame is about who I am. So if I do something that is wrong, and I hurt somebody, but if I take it to a whole new level of because I hurt somebody, I am a bad person. Now we've gone from guilt to shame. Shame is crippling, and it is often undealt with, untouched, in a lot of ways, whether it's outpatient therapy, residential therapy, whatever. It is an uh, incredibly complex thing that sparks a lot of this stuff. Uh, number three up there, a bad kid and a good family. Just stop the bad kid. If somebody believes they're bad, guess what that's the first seed for? Uh, Patrick Carnes, one of the leading researchers for addictions in the world, uh, says there are four beliefs that every addict has. And once I found that list, I've used them with every kid I've worked with. About 80% or more of those kids had all four. Some of them are, I'm a bad person, I'm unlovable, uh, I, if I have to depend on others, uh, uh, my needs won't be taken care of. And the last one is, if I have to live without blank, I will die. Those are the four beliefs that, those, that, that addicts commonly have. I see those in kids, too. They just apply them in different ways. Okay, number four. Six to twelve years old, the bulk of the school year. Uh, this is a lot of uh, comparing to peers, uh, figuring out where I fit among my peers, my social group. A lot of that stuff happens in these years. Um, now, not only am I autonomous, and not only can I start something on my own, can I resource it? Am I industrious enough to take a project, maybe the the uh, school teacher gives them a, a paper to do. Uh, favorite thing from the summer. And they uh, write the paper, they get some pictures, and they get a couple objects from the summer, and they come in and they do a show and tell. Basically. They're industrious. They're taking a task and going right down the line of these are all the things that I need to complete the task. The and synthesis of this one is if I can't do all that, again, there's something wrong with me. You see the pattern here? There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. Comparing themselves to the, their peers. If I can't do all of that, and when I look around, I see other people being able to, then I'm inferior. I'm less than. Uh, there's something so wrong with me that I'm a different class of person below these other people. That's a problem. It shapes our motivations, our behaviors, all kinds of stuff. Huge, huge ways. Okay, stage number five, my favorite. Twelve to eighteen years old, high school identity. Major task in a person's life between these ages is to. 
figure out who they are, what their boundaries are, what they stand for, what they fall for, their position, uh, what they think about themselves and the world around them, everything that makes up their individualness, their unique identity as a person. Okay? They, um, like we said before, they're not a clone. So they're, they're not going to say, well, I'm like that person. No, you're your own person. You get to dress differently if you want to. You get to do your hair. You get you Not just the outside stuff, the inside stuff too. Who are you as a person? Um, Murray Bono, big family systems guy, would say, this is about individuation. This is the kid becoming their own person, separate and apart from their parents. Yes, their parents birthed them, raised them, gave them all the stuff they needed. They're now trying to become their own person. And what he would say is that's why uh, we have uh, teenagers do a lot of acting out. is because they're experimenting. They're trying to figure out their own way, what they're going to do, what they're not going to do, where their boundaries are, what's too much and what's too little, all that stuff. Kind of agree, kind of disagree. Because guess what? We're not of the world. Our kids are Christian. Our kids follow God. And we think a little differently about that. What, what's, what's the... Larry, you're a walking Bible. What's the verse that says, teach them the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it? It's Proverbs. It's Proverbs. And then the other one is, uh, teach them... Teach them the scriptures as you walk along the road, and eat the meal, and lay your head down the rest. That one too. That's our job as parents, is to carry them all along that road. That includes identity. See, this is a key time for they begin to question their beliefs in Christianity. Because of the fact, they don't want their mom's faith, so to speak, and what they believe. They want to know. And most kids leave the law in college because they don't really know why they believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. So it's really important at this age that they begin to learn in a sense what we call apologetics. Why is there a God? Why does he speak? Defending their faith. Yeah. In a way that's proper. Because this is what we deal with the kids that come to the ranch at this age. They're a Christian because their mom and dad made them be a Christian. They had an emotional experience one time. It's solid. I'm not saying it's wrong, but they don't know why they believe right. it now. They're struggling with all these things, and where's God? Own, own faith versus carried faith. Yeah. Carried faith is, I, I have this because it was given to me. Own faith is, I have this because I believe it. Because I know it. That's a huge difference. And I didn't learn that until I was in college. I, I was lucky enough to go to a Christian college. One of my first Bible classes, that's what they taught us about. It was an own faith versus a carried faith. Guess what I did? I walked out of that class and said, wait a minute, is there God? Do I believe in God? What do I believe? I, I took that seriously and I said, wait a minute, what is this? Why do I believe in this? And I'm not on the same page with my parents on some things. And that's okay. Because I own it. I had to, I had to figure out what I believed and why I believed it. And now, I love apologetics. I can't wait. So, let's say that a kid struggles with identity. And they become confused about all this stuff. They, they become confused about who they are, where they fit, what's going on around them, um, why other people think differently than they do, why um, um, other people act differently. And they do all of this stuff is up for grabs, and and one of the one of the things I like about working with teenagers so much is they're like sponges. They want to know stuff. You just got to give it to them. You got to give it to them in the right way, but you got to give it to them. If you don't give it to them, guess what? They're going to get it somewhere else. Now, there are eight stages in this. We're going to stop at number six, and. Uh, I'll let you guys figure out what number seven and eight are when you do your own research on this. Stage six, 18 years, 
adult, we all know that 18 is a number, but we hear it's all yet. 18 to 40, roughly. It's basically the, the years of relationships. Now, there's one thing that our culture does differently than the world. And I'm going to explain it to you like this. This is a question for all the ladies in the room, including the ladies back there. How many times, when you were between 12 and 14 years old, did somebody come up to you, an aunt, a grandma, maybe your parents, somebody else you, you looked up to, how many times did they come up and say this? Have you got a boyfriend yet? What's the date? Going out. You got a date? How many did that? All of you, right? No? <laughs> <laughs> The vast majority of people <laughs> have that experience. Uh, you're the first one who's ever said no. <laughs> um, guess what? A 12 year old, or even a 14 year old, they don't know who they are. So, what message did they just get? Wait a minute. Grandma thinks I should have a boyfriend. I don't have a boyfriend. Is there something? I can't even get a boyfriend. So, she goes and gets a boyfriend. Now, what's the relationship based on? She had to go get a boyfriend to, number one, make grandma happy. Number two, because she thought she was supposed to. Well, guess what? She hasn't figured out relationships yet. So the relationship is tenuous at best. Guess what happens when he breaks up with her? Her identity just walked out the door. Her identity left. Now guess what? I can't go back to grandma with this. I gotta go get another boyfriend. Goes and gets another. And on and on and on. Because it's not based on having a, a truly intimate, not sexual, relationship. You can't, at 12 to 18 years old, I'm glad there's no teenagers around. They don't know what love is. They think it's an emotion, it's not, it's a decision. So when a 12, 14, 16, 18 year old gets a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they don't know who they are, they're in trouble. Guess what? I call this the backwards fish. If they don't know, um, if they don't know who they are and they go and get this relationship, they um, are going to get confused because. Oh wait, I'm going to back. <laughs> I haven't done this in a while. If they're 12 to 18 years old and their identity is based on a relationship, not based on what they think it is, they think they're being intimate because I got a boyfriend, I love her. I got a girlfriend, I love her. They're going to have experience isolation because when that relationship breaks up from them, they're going to um, um, think that they're supposed to have it but they don't have it, so they're going to feel isolated. Well, guess what? Western society flips these two. Western society is the only one in the world that says, at 12 or 14 or 16 years old, you should have a boyfriend or girlfriend. Because guess what, people? That's normal. It's not. Look at the rest of the world. They don't let them do it until they're, what, 18, 19, 20 years old. They prevent them from doing it because they know they're not ready for them. Say it's based on tribal culture if you want to, but it works that way. And, and the civilized world says they should have it at 14. Wait a minute, they don't know who they are. So, so they think they know intimacy, they don't. They feel isolated because they're isolated, they feel confused because they started out not knowing who they were. If they don't know who they are, they shouldn't be having 